All right, we are live. Thank you for joining us today. Today I'm joined by Ask Truth Apologetics, and we're going to continue our comparison of the morals taught by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount to those taught by Islam, uh, attributed to Muhammad. Mm -hmm. We're going to be looking, uh, or the focus of today is going to be Matthew 6, which is going to be why we should do good, comparing why um, Muslims are taught to do good to why Christians are taught to do good. Let me open us with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for the technology that allows us to connect with fellow believers and non-believers from around the world. We ask that you be with us today, that you guide our discussion, and you prevent us from theological error. We ask that anyone watching, whether they are Christian, Muslim, or otherwise, approach the material with an open mind, that they see the inherent superiority of Jesus to all other belief systems. We pray that anything that we say is true and useful is remembered and applied to people's lives. Anything that we say that is false is simply forgotten. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you want to bring up the presentation, we'll start with a little bit of a summary of what we did last time. We can do that. And uh, I will encourage everyone, if they have not yet watched that one, um, this is we're just going through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which is Matthew chapter five, chapter six and chapter seven. So it's a three part little series that we're going to be running here. Uh, last week uh, was a big one. Um, so go ahead and review that. Uh, and we had a lot of fun too, Thaddeus. We had a little bit of fun with uh, some some Muslims. So hopefully we can get some interaction again, and uh, you know, show them who's boss. <laughs> That's a good point. I will open up the the stream uh, later on for Muslims yeah. to join us live, and uh, comments are welcome throughout. We will attempt to address those. This is an interactive program. We do want Muslims to come and defend their religion. Um, unfortunately, the the Muslims that joined us last time didn't do a great job of defending it, but I still appreciate them coming mm -hmm. because most Muslims are afraid to even do that. They just exactly. want to sit back and either say nothing or criticize Christianity. Exactly. Yep. So uh, we'll just kind of jump right into it here. Hopefully, um, I've tried to work out my technical kinks. Can you see, Mr. Thaddeus? We can. Oh, it's a big deal today. It's a very big deal today. Praise, praise God. All right. So... Um, like I said, we're, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, the, the mora morality taught by Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount, and doing a comparison between um, what Muhammad and Islam taught through it. So we'll just kind of jump straight into a review here. All right. So from last week, we established a couple of fun things. One, that Allah is a pagan. We also established that uh, marriage in Christianity is considered sacred because it represents the marriage between Christ and his church, whereas marriage in Islam is kind of representative of Allah and his slaves, right? So the man in the household in Islam is basically the slave master to his supposed to be obedient wife, who is basically, like I said, a slave. Um, because Allah is proud and arrogant and not humble, we found out that he will not inherit the earth. So just from Matthew chapter 5, we learned that uh, Jesus' morality is significantly, significantly better than Muhammad's and Islam's morality teachings. And one of the things that we were talking about, which was kind of funny, was even if even if, you know, Muslims always make the claim, right, that our Bible is corrupted or man-made or something like that, how we, dis we discussed how, well, that's actually even worse for Muslims. If man-made corrupted uh, moral teachings are akbar or greater, right, than the supposedly divinely uh, revealed word of Allah, then that, uh, that's more of a problem than if it's, you know, God abrogating God or something like that. So we're going to kind of jump into the Sermon on the Mount. I will warn you guys, this one's not as juicy as Matthew chapter 5, but there's going to be a little bit of juice in it. 
Um, yeah, well, you don't say that. You don't tell people, eh, don't tune in. Yeah, don't watch, one. guys. No need to watch. <laughs> um, fast forward through it, whatever. Um, no, but this is this is great teachings, guys. I mean, honest, honestly, this is these are the words of Jesus through one of his most famous sermons. So whatever we gain from this will absolutely be a gain. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I think to, to be clear, what you're saying is that the... Uh, the gospel is equally powerful as the first time. It's just not quite as juicy as, say, uh, Oleg calling himself a polytheist. <laughs> yeah. Now we will compare a lot to a polytheist here. Don't you? Don't you worry. This is going to happen, and we're going to present that he is no better than pagans and tax collectors. Um, but there's just not as much. Uh, the, the The message here with Jesus in chapter six is is uh, pretty pretty straightforward. So. Excellent. Uh, before you dive in, I did yeah. want to say a couple other words about last time. We had this challenge to Muslims. Name one way that you're morally <laughs> inferior to Muhammad. And mm -hmm. we had, I don't know, about five Muslims join us at, at one point or another, and none of them could answer that question. And then uh, Safraz came up live, and he struggled really bad yeah. to answer that question. And he eventually just said, well, they're all the same. They're all human beings, right? Yep. He, so he, he kind of come yielded. up with any way that Muhammad's better than him. Right. He he basically, without saying it, because I don't think he would ever ad admit that he was incorrect in a sense, but basically what he said was, um, well, all prophets are sinners, so it's okay that Muhammad sinned, even though he continued to repeat himself and say that Muhammad apparently <laughs> was sinless. Um, it was it was rather embarrassing. So go ahead and rewatch that one. Uh, it was a, it was a good time. Good time for all of us. And then just one other note about the last one. Last time I put out a challenge to get Ask Truth above a thousand subscribers. So you guys met that challenge. Yay! Good work. So today's challenge, uh, last video got 143 likes so far. So to this one, I want 144 likes. Yep, you got to wage jihad, y'all, on that like button. But remember that you must strike it an odd number of times. All right, so diving in. Um, this is going to be, I, I want us to keep this verse in mind. This is the very first verse of chapter six. And Jesus says, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your father in heaven, right? So this is going to be the compare and contrast verse. Are Christians called to do good deeds in front of others so that they receive that reward um, and are Muslims called to do the same thing. And so we're going to read through some of the primary sources and some uh, contemporary Islamic sources to compare and contrast the teachings of Jesus relative to the teachings of Muhammad when it comes to doing good deeds. And, and before you move on, I, I think we can already see that this is going to be a problem for Muslims because we can see constantly that they're doing their good deeds in public mm -hmm. because Islam is a political system and they want to express their dominance. They don't necessarily care about what's in your heart. They care about following the legal law and making everyone know that. And if at all possible, making them do the same. Exactly. Exactly. So we'll, we'll talk about when that can be good and when that can be bad. Right. But the, the, the one of the key phrases we're going to focus on today is hypocrisy. Right. Uh, Jesus talks a lot in this in this chapter about the hypocrisy of people. So he says, when you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward that they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Sorry, I'm keeping my notes here, right? So this is like an interesting little little snippet here, right? Because I, I don't see what Muslims teach contemporarily as being incredibly different from what Jesus is teaching here, right? So when I was putting together this presentation, I went and researched... What are the rules for giving in Islam? And I came across this place called the Zakat Foundation of America. Right, so I went ahead and read their website. And as you can see here, they say this. And let's see if we can recognize the words that they chose to use and who they forgot to give that credit <laughs> to. 
So they say, we often hear that when giving charity, we should do so in a way that our left hand doesn't know what our right hand has spent. So does that mean that we are only ever supposed to give charity in secret? They move on to answer. Well, actually, they say both ways are permissible. Islam supports giving charity in private as the best form of giving. But there's something to be said about giving it publicly, as long as one is aware of their intentions and behavior. So they go on and they cite a couple of different Quranic verses, and I added one in here as well for them. So basically, uh, Quran chapter 2, verses 271, 272, and 274. I'll read these in order. If you publish your free will offerings, it is excellent. Right? So pause there. If you do this in public, <laughs> it is excellent. But if you conceal them and give them to the poor, well, that's better for you and will acquit you of your evil deeds because God is aware of the things that you do. So I want us to focus on that last little bit there, right? We can clearly see two things. One, that they stole the, the verse from Jesus, right? Don't let your left hand know what your right is, hand is doing. They also say the opposite of what Jesus says, right? They say, go for it. Do your trumpets, blare your trumpets, give freely. Um, but it's kind of better if you don't do it in secret. But either way, it's all good. And then the other thing here is I want us to focus on the transactional nature that Islam likes to focus on, right? The transaction of good deeds versus bad deeds, right? This is a, this is a system that pretty much all other religions besides Christianity hold. This is a system kind of like karma. A lot of people are, are uh, understand the, the words of karma, right? So if you do good deeds, uh, you get good rewards. If you do bad deeds, you get bad rewards, right? And so the Islamic, one of the many Islamic concepts of how someone enters into paradise is that their good deeds must outdo their bad deeds or outweigh their bad deeds. Now, Thaddeus, is that always true? Does Allah sometimes just do whatever he wants. Well, I would say that's uh, rarely true. That's more of a modern <laughs> Muslim conception yep. and not something that is actually taught by the Quran or, or the Hadith. Uh, this idea that there's a balancing scale and Allah just says if you do more good than evil, uh, you know, keeping in mind that different deeds have different values, yep. but yep. Then, then you're good to go. And But when you look at the early texts or you know the early opinions of muslims when you look at the actual words of the quran it seems to just say that allah has willed some to go to jenna and some to go to hell and that's all there is to it yeah exactly and it's a very interesting it's a it's a very interesting thing right because you you see on the one hand uh that you know doing deeds is good but on the other hand it just basically says like allah has predestined you for hellfire or for paradise and um there's even i can't remember it's if it's a hadith or if it's an actual Quranic passage, uh, but it talks about um, if someone was destined for hell, they might do good deeds, the, the, the deeds of paradise their entire life, up until uh, the end part of their life, where then Allah will make them start doing the deeds of hell. So there is actually a deeds relationship here, but the question is, where do the good deeds come from? Is it given freely or does Allah predestine and force that person to do the good deeds? And the opposite is true, right? Someone could do evil their entire life. Um, and then all of a sudden, because they're getting close to death, all of a sudden Allah forces them to start doing the deeds of paradise to where they get into paradise. But again, they're not focused on the love and mercy and grace of God. They're actually focused on um, selfish selfish desires, right? Of course they want to avoid hell. Of course they want to go to heaven. And Allah is giving rules here for how someone can earn their way to heaven, even though they actually can't. Again, it always makes sense if you don't think about it. So we try not to analyze these things too far. Uh, so is. Ron asked uh, what the reference for this verse was. It was uh, This is chapter two, uh, verses 271. As you can see, I'm reading the Arbery translation. Excellent. And uh, he also commented, I had a chat with a Muslim about this, and he said they do good deeds to have a better chance with Allah. Right, and that's, that's kind of what it comes down to. Of, yeah, interesting yeah. choice of words there, you know, have a better chance. You, mm -hmm. you, no guarantee. And, uh, 
Uh, and no uh, guarantee that you're going to hell if you don't do the good deeds either. It just increases your odds somewhat, maybe. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's kind of like playing the lottery, right? Like if, if you don't play at all, right, it's probably unlikely that you're going to win. Um, so you just want to, <laughs> you know, stack the odds ever in your favor um, and, and do the best you can, right? So so maybe Allah will reward you or maybe you were already predestined for hell. Maybe you're predestined for heaven. You don't really know. Um, and so I guess you do the best you can and, and, uh, cross your fingers and hope Allah had a good day and woke up on the, uh, the correct side of the bed. Indeed. Uh, before you move on, uh, I just have a question for Muslims to consider here. Let's just say theoretically someone was crafting a religion and they wanted to generate as much income out of it as possible. Hmm. How would they advise you give charity? You know, it seems to me it'd be something like this. Do it in public so everyone knows about it, or do it in private if you prefer. Either way, you're good to go because uh, your your donations are going to override your evil deeds, and they're going to cause <laughs> you to be blessed. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Right, how fear um, creates this kind of income for the leaders of Islam. It's very interesting, isn't it? Indeed. Um, all right. So the next verse, uh, two two seventy two, says, "Thou art." not responsible for guiding them. So they're talking about the people that you give to. But God guides whomsoever he wills. Exactly like you said here, Thaddeus. And whatever good you expend is for yourselves, for then you are expending, being desirous only for God's face. And whatever good you expend shall be repaid to you in full, and you will not be wronged unless you were predestined for hell to begin with. Um, and then the final verse here, this is 274. So chapter 2, um, Ayah 274. Those who expend their wealth night and day, secretly and in public, their wage awaits them with their Lord, and no fear shall be on them, neither shall they sorrow. Right. So like I said kind of here uh, earlier, whoop, I'm going to go back here, sorry. Like, like I said here earlier, what's interesting is, is how the website like we said, chose to use Jesus' own words, but gave him no credits, right? The citations that we that were reading here um, when it comes to the Quranic passages, they talk about how it's a self-serving giving, right? Yeah, yes, you are helping someone else, but really it's for helping yourself so that Allah will like you more. Um, and Jesus points out that giving publicly does actually give you a reward, right? That is like, if I go out and I give publicly, people are going to praise me. They go, oh, what a great, generous gift giver. He's an amazing person, which Jesus says that you've actually received your reward then, but you do not receive your reward later. And in fact, from the theme verse that we talked about, right, when you do it for the purpose of impressing others, you actually lose your reward uh, with your father, and we're going to get into this father thing, in heaven, right? So this is what Jesus has to say, moving on to prayers and fasting. Well, hold on. Before yeah. you do that, I did have a follow-up from Ron um, about his Muslim friend. Mm -hmm. He said it was all based on Allah's mercy and that Allah was more inclined to be merciful uh, if you gave charitable donations or, or, you know, other good deeds. And I think yeah. that's actually very interesting here, that somehow you're changing the will of God by your own actions, almost like this is a, a, a being that, that is not clearly superior to human mm -hmm. beings. That he, he stands apart from them, but he's influenced by them, and their, right. their actions determine his decisions. Very strange stuff. No, exactly. And, and if you go to the, to the end of our, our video slides from our last presentation, we talked about um, if, if you love someone who loves you first, you're no different than pagans and tax collectors, right? And we talked about how Allah, uh, in the 100 times that the word love is in the Quran, none of those times does Allah say that he loves anyone first, right? So this is a major problem, right? Because Muslims will tell us that Allah is independent. Like we can't influence him in any way, shape, or form. Um, we, he, is, he is not contingent on anything. But when you actually think about this passage, when it comes to love or accepting and giving mercy and stuff like that, it makes actually Allah dependent, right? We're contingent upon your behaviors. This is not 
the God of the Bible. This is the exact opposite of the God of the Bible, whom in 1 John says that God is love and that the only reason that we're even capable of love is because God loved us first, right? So in the in the Christian concept of God, God is actually independent. His love for us is um, non-compromising. He loves us no matter what. However, in Islam, it has to do with uh, if you choose to love God first, even though you don't have a choice. Once again, makes sense if if you don't think about it. And uh, it looks like noted troll Swati Dawa has joined us today, just on the off off chance that he's actually paying attention and thinking. Hmm. Let's go ahead and answer this question okay. for him. Uh, do the Christians know they will go to heaven and not to hell? Uh, only if we have faith in God and the works that he promised to give to us. Um, so I, I don't know about you, Thaddeus, but I actually don't trust myself. Uh, I know that I'm a sinner who deserves nothing but hellfire, but I also know Jesus, and I know that he promised us that if we follow him, take up our crosses and follow him and believe in him, like the Israelites believed in the serpent on the pole, um, that they too will be saved, or we too will be saved. So my faith is actually not in myself. My faith is in Jesus Christ, our God, our Lord, our Savior. So if I have faith in Jesus, I have no fear of death. I have no fear of hell. I don't know if you can say the same thing as a Muslim. I feel like as a Muslim, you can't actually have that assurance because, well, you don't actually trust a law to be merciful and you can't possibly trust yourself to be good enough. So the I'm going to put the question back on you, buddy. How do you know that you're going to go to heaven? I don't think Absolutely. you can. Uh, someone said yes in the chat and he said, how do you know that? I'm assuming that was probably not directly to what you're saying because of the mm -hmm. delay um, and was response to the yes. But the reason we're confident, as you just said, is because we're not relying on our own good no. deeds. We're not relying on our own abilities. We're not relying on our ourselves doing anything. Rather, we're relying mm -hmm. on what has already been done on our behalf by God. We're placing our trust exclusively in God, not in ourselves. That's exactly. That's we can have confidence. Exactly. And I believe it's Isaiah chapter 40. It says that God is our only Savior. I want you guys to let that sink in. God is our only Savior savior it's not a hard logical conclusion to figure out that if jesus is our only savior that makes jesus god so moving on a little bit more of the hypocrisy stuff right so this is a big one for for muslims prayer is really important for muslims they do it five times a day right and we'll kind of dive into how they do this and whether or not it aligns with the teachings of jesus so jesus says when you pray don't be like the hypocrites who love to play, pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Once again, father. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Okay, so let's talk about how Muslims are supposed to pray. And we're going to review here really quickly, right? Um, it says, do not be like the hypocrites who blow the trumpets and they want to be seen on the street corners by everyone. Instead, go into a private room, pray to your father, right? And don't repeat the same thing over and over and over again. So I'm curious as to whether or not Muslims do this five times a day, repeat <laughs> the same prayers over and over and over again. If the call to prayer is not heard in Muslim majority lands over and over and over again, right? Ever since 1400 years ago, or, or whatever, but basically what they're doing is they're announcing, they're announcing, we are praying now. Everybody who can hear this, we are praying now. What, what, is, is their reward with the Father in heaven, according to Jesus, or is their reward in that moment from people thinking that they're awesome? What do you think that is? Yeah, I'm going to say it's, it, 
any reward they get is what they get here on earth because this exactly. is the exact opposite of what Jesus did and an exact copy of what the pagans uh, did, I might add. It they is interesting. They thought that the more words they gave, the more inclined the God would be to hear them mm -hmm. because gods were not fundamentally good. It's like if you know him enough, he'll give you what you want kind of right. deal. Right, yeah, and, and Jesus talks about that as well. Okay, so uh, you may have seen on the news at the beginning of Ramadan, uh, Times Square was basically shut down. Uh, all A bunch of Muslims congregated into Times Square all over the street corners, right? And this is like the largest street corner on earth. They filled this up. So thousands of Muslims are, were praying on the streets and the sidewalks, right? But this, this doesn't just happen in Times Square once a year, right? This happens all over the world all the time right muslims will stop traffic they will bring out their prayer mats into public they will get their reward by doing this right so what we see is you know they're standing up they're kneeling down they're prostrating standing up kneeling down prostrating and what do they do they say the same things over and over and over again day in day out throughout their entire lifetime and we've already established that this is the actions and behaviors of hypocrites and of pagans, right? This is not what Jesus is telling us to do, right? Jesus tells us in the next verses how we ought to pray, right? He says, don't be like them for you're not, your father knows exactly what you need before you ask, right? Meaning that God is omnipresent, whereas Allah actually isn't omnipresent because he's unable to enter into his own creation. But what is the Lord's prayer? This is what Jesus tells us to say. He says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have you ever heard, yeah, amen, have you ever heard a Muslim tell you, Thaddeus, that Jesus prayed like a Muslim? I have. Mm. You know, have I they... used to think that Muslim arguments on YouTube were really bad, and then I got on <laughs> Facebook. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> and no. I, every other meme practice, well, first of all, all the posts were memes, and like every third one or so would be, Jesus prayed like a Muslim, why don't you pray mm. like Jesus? Right, because one time Jesus fell on his face, which exactly. is apparently is the exact same thing as the Muslims do when they when they prostrate. Um, but what's interesting is Jesus is teaching us, right? We've just reviewed how Muslims pray, and Jesus has clearly and explicitly said, if you pray like, insert what the Muslims do, you are praying like a hypocrite. So is Jesus praying like a hypocrite? I don't think so. Allah, it says in the Quran over and over and over and over and over again, is a father to no one. And yet we read the very first thing that, that we are to pray like is to pray to our father who is in heaven. All right. And then he goes on to say, hallowed be thy name or sacred is thy name. And we established this last time we talked to Swati or whoever. No, it was Sassafras. We established this last time we talked to Sassafras, right? Hallowed is the name of the Father. Hallowed is the name of the God of the, the, of the Bible, of Israel, right? And what is his name? Does Allah share that same name? So we're establishing a couple of different things. One, Muhammad is definitely, de or sorry, heaven forgive me. Jesus is definitely, definitely, definitely not Muslim, okay? <laughs> and Allah is definitely, definitely, definitely not Yahweh, which is the sacred name that Jews today won't even announce. They call him Hashem, which Sassafras didn't even know what Hashem meant. He just thought that was the name. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're like, that, that was great. You're like, the name of God is Yahweh. And he's like, well, why do the Jews call him Hashem then? <laughs> I asked him, do you even know what Hashem means? And he was like, uh, 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 that's... Type, 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 type. Yeah. Uh, uh, it says right here, it means the name. 
Right. Exactly. He didn't even know that. He didn't even his his prophet Google was unable to give him an, an the correct answer. He never he never did find it. So I think we eventually gave him the answer, whether or not he heard. I have no idea. Right. So it's pretty clear, y'all. Jesus ain't Muslim. And in fact, Jesus would say that how the Muslims go about praying is completely wrong. They don't pray to the Father. They don't know that God's name is Yahweh, and they pray like hypocrites. All right. I love this passage, right? This is, this is a very beautiful, beautiful passage. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. All right. So when we talked uh, in our last video about the Beatitudes and how we're supposed to love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us, etc., 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 right? Um, we demonstrated over and over and over again how the Muslims are actually told to be the persecutors, right? They are the ones who are actually persecuting people. They are the ones who are not providing forgiveness. And in which case, according to Matthew chapter 16, or sorry, 6 verses 14 to 15 here on your screen, they will not have their sins forgiven because they are unwilling. They are too prideful and arrogant to forgive other people's sins, right? So we should forgive others. Now, Thaddeus, I don't know about your pastor or preacher <laughs> um, and, and what they say, right? But there's pretty common sayings. When, one thing that my guy says is hurt people hurt people. Have you ever heard that before? I haven't heard that particular one, but it, okay. it makes sense. Right. So if I've been hurt or you've been hurt, Thaddeus, it's more likely that you're going to want to harm another person. That's pretty standard, natural, animalistic behaviors, right? Eye for an eye type of thing. We talked about earlier that eye for an eye no longer applicable, that we should forgive those who who persecute us, right? Because if we don't, Jesus is saying that our father won't forgive us either. So if we understand that hurt people hurt people, we need to also learn that forgiven people forgive people and praise Jesus that he has forgiven me. He's forgiven you, Thaddeus. He's forgiven all of us if we just get on our knees and pray for Jesus to, to remove our sins, right? Then all of a sudden we become redeemed. We become forgiven and our nature changes. Our heart of stone is taken out, and we are then given a heart of flesh and the Holy Spirit so that we can forgive others who sin against us. It's a, it's a, it's a change that happens within true Christians. We go from having the behaviors of animals, right? Fight, flight, that type of stuff, to having the behavior of God, right? to be like God, to be made in his images, to be loving, kind, forgiving, merciful, gracious. And so once we've been forgiven, we then start to forgive. Yeah, and uh, before you move on, just forgiving is so important in the, the biblical narrative that Jesus says this other parable where he says he describes this, this man who has been forgive goes to the king, mm -hmm. says that, you know, I can't pay my debt, and it's... Uh, 10,000 talents, but to put it in modern terms, that's, you know, like millions and millions of dollars, right? It's an amount that an ordinary person could never possibly replay in many mm -hmm. lifetimes. And that's our standing before God, right? We're, we're so deficient in, in our um, standing before God that it's like we owe this massive, massive debt. And then the guy, he's forgiven, and, and that's what God does for us. But then he goes and says to his coworker that owes him 20 bucks, uh, if you don't pay that debt, I'm going to throw you in prison. Right. And, and then, and then the King comes back and says, are you insane? I forgave you this massive debt and you're not forgiving mm -hmm. the tiny debts other people owe you. And, and that's where we stand, you know, where we've been forgiven a massive debt by God. And then we're not forgiving our fellow human beings. It, it, it's a really strange situation. It is. It is. And unfortunately, I mean, a lot of, and, and this is what I want to make clear, um, a lot of Muslims are significantly better than how their religion teaches them to be, right? So when I, when I talk about hypocrisy and, and things like that, I'm not saying every single Muslim that you meet on the street, your Muslim friend, all those types of things, I'm not saying that they're this evil, hypocritical person. I'm not saying that at all. And I want to make that clear. 
right? But what I am saying is that their religion teaches them to be that way, right? So we're, we're, we're not comparing necessarily the behaviors of the adherence to a religion. We are um, examining the teachings of their religion on how they ought to behave. So that's how we need to be judging people based on based on what the religion tells them to be relative to how they actually are. Make sense? Absolutely. And uh, uh, simultaneously, John left this related um, comment. Please mm -hmm. inform the audience that what some Christians do or don't do is irrelevant. They'll always be wolves in sheep's clothing. Absolutely. Matters is what Jesus taught. And you were just talking about how we shouldn't mm -hmm. judge Islam by the way Muslims act. Likewise, right. we shouldn't judge Christianity by the way some Christians act. Mm -hmm. We should judge both by what they actually teach, and that's what we're attempting to do here today. Uh, I, unfortunately, we find that most Muslims are, are way better than the teachings that they're given, uh, and most Christians are, well, all Christians are, are worse than the teachings that, that we are given because mm -hmm. Christianity acknowledges we're fallen human beings, and right. Islam kind of teaches you to to be, it celebrates being a fallen human being. And, right. you know, like, for example, what we saw earlier where, you know, give money to, to make up for your bad deeds. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's not self-serving at all now, is it? Um, and what was I going to say? It probably escaped me. Um, yeah, whatever. We'll move on. It'll come back to me. Um, do you, you want to add anything to that, Thaddeus, before we move on? Uh, no. Um, so I put Swati in time out and he just came <laughs> back. Um, and oh, poor buddy, he, he retracted his message. So I just going to reiterate the reason you're putting time in isn't because of what you said. It's because it was off topic. You were trying to distract, change the topic, talk about something else, talk about what we're actually talking about today. You can mm -hmm. talk about whatever other thing you want to talk about when we're talking about that subject. But today we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount as found in Matthew 6 compared to the teachings of Muhammad. Exactly. And, and what, I was, what I was going to say, it came back to me, is Thaddeus, I'll, I'll just ask you this. Who is our pattern of conduct? Who are we supposed to follow and emulate to the best of our ability? That would be Jesus. Okay. And it's very simple and easy to examine Jesus' life and determine whether or not he was perfect and holy or if he had blemishes and sin. Now, help me out here, Thaddeus. Was he perfect and holy or did he have sins? Uh, he was perfect and holy. Yeah. So it's very easy for us to answer the question, right? How are we morally inferior to Jesus? It's very easy. We can say very simply, we are not God, we are not perfect, we are not holy, we are not sinless. So every sin and un imperfect thing I've ever done puts me short of the glory of God and then the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Whereas the Muslim question, who is their pattern of conduct? Well, clearly it's Muhammad. And Muhammad did all kinds of abhorrent things. And it's difficult, as we witnessed last week, it's actually difficult, if not impossible, for a Muslim to tell us how they are morally inferior to their pattern of conduct. And it's not a difficult leap here in logic. If you are morally superior or even equal to your pattern of conduct, then that's probably not a role model that you should be following. You should follow someone who actually realistically was perfect, not someone who you have to make up excuses for all the sins that they've committed right right absolutely all right anything else my man nope i think we're good for now all right we'll, we'll wait for our next macro distraction here uh fasting and when you fast this one applies to uh muslims especially now since it's ramadan don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they will try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward that they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face, then no one will notice that you are fasting, right? Left hand, right hand situation, right? Except for your father, who knows what you do in private, and your father who sees everything will reward you, right? So I, I, got, a, I got a joke prepared, Thaddeus. I don't know if you right. read it or not. It's not a good joke. <laughs> if you read it, 
pretend you didn't. Okay. Okay. But if you know the answer, go for it. Um, how do you know if someone does CrossFit? Well, I did read the joke, but I'll just <laughs> say I don't know. So that... All right. Because they never <laughs> stop talking about CrossFit. How do you know someone is a vegan? Um, probably because they always talk about how wonderful they are for not eating animals. Exactly. They will tell you immediately, how do you know it's Ramadan when you talk to a Muslim? Uh, they'll tell you about the, their fasting. Over and over well, and over again. If we can right? even fairly call it that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, so they are getting their reward over and over and over again, right? But we do know that uh, eating vegetables is healthy. You agree with that, right? I do. And you do know that smoking is unhealthy for you. You know that, right? Yes. Have you ever heard people say that like um, secondhand smoking is actually worse for you than like firsthand smoking? Because I guess it's not filtered or something. Yes. Okay. Um, so then to me, the same would be true for eating vegetables. This is I'm talking to the vegans here. No offense, vegans. Um, so if eating firsthand vegetables is healthy for you, then eating secondhand vegetables has got to be way more healthy for you. So that is why I get my vegetables secondhand by eating the animals that ate the vegetables. So uh, applying this to fasting, and maybe that's why Muslims will brag about the, their fasting and post pictures on, on Twitter and whatnot, mm -hmm. because reading about fasting is more beneficial to you than actually fasting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like, like you said, they post pictures, they talk about it over and over and over again. They focus on what it is that they're doing. They announce it to everyone. I'm fasting. I'm fasting. I'm fasting. Um, maybe not all Muslims, right? If, if you are a Muslim right now who is fasting and you've not announced it to anyone and you're doing it because you truly love God and you truly want to want to follow him, then I would tell you if you truly love God and want to follow him, submit to Jesus. But otherwise, you're at least not being a hypocrite in the eyes of Jesus. Uh, the next section that uh, Jesus talks about here in Matthew chapter 6 is faith and finance. Right. So he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths and eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. So this relates to everything that Jesus was saying prior to this. Right. Don't store up all these good deeds. Don't store up all these accolades from people. Don't get all of those things, because guess what? This life is temporary. This life will end. It will eventually decay, deteriorate, and no one will remember how great you were within a couple of generations, probably. Make sense? He's saying don't store up all of those things on earth. Don't try to just get earthly rewards, right? Your faith should be focused on pleasing God and God alone and not people, not the thoughts of men, but the thoughts and heart of God. So he says, store up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying focus on God. Focus on the kingdom of heaven. Focus on pleasing God and God alone. And don't worry about if you're looking cool in front of your friends. Makes sense? Definitely. All right. Anything to did, add? Yeah. Uh, well, did you have a, a Quran verse that you wanted to quote for this one? I don't oh, want to. Oh, maybe I did. I, I wasn't sure if you were going to or not. But the, ironically, one of the two verses that web, Muslim website gave um, to support mm -hmm. giving donations encourages you to build up your wealth. Amazing. Oh, yeah. I, I do have a, I do have a, a, a slide on that here in a little bit. Um, I was like, I was like, man, you know my slideshow better than I know my slideshow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll, maybe I'll put you in charge of this next time. All right, so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, yep, and if I don't for some reason, let's let's alrighty backtrack so, to it. Uh, Origins is in the house. I had a live stream with Origins earlier today, so be sure to check that out if you haven't already. I think it was an excellent overview of why we shouldn't believe the standard Islamic narrative, why it's not historically accurate. Word. Yep. And I need to watch that. I was too busy doing this as opposed to watching that. <laughs> so I am eagerly awaiting that, right? So the sin, the standard Islamic narrative um, just doesn't make sense. It really honestly doesn't. And 
probably the the most condemning evidence against Islam in in that particular field with the Islamic narrative is the 100% lack of archaeological evidence, historical evidence, uh, geological evidence that anyone even inhabited modern day Mecca. So I don't know if that was exactly what you guys were talking about, but uh, Mecca wasn't actually mentioned, but that would yeah. be another excellent example. Um, yeah, that's been... we actually looked at how Muslim early so-called Muslim practice didn't match the what is taught in the Hadith, suggesting that Hadith hadn't been written yet at the time. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but kind of just coming back to Mecca existing or not, that's kind of a big deal, right? Because that's quote unquote the mother of of all cities uh, we we need to you know wherever muhammad's from that's that's where it is um but i i engaged with a muslim for months months on this so he's actually from saudi arabia and we just went back and forth back and forth um for months like i said on discord um and he could not provide a single not a single reference or archaeological piece of evidence to support that anyone lived in Mecca before 700 AD. There's literally not any evidence that I've come across, and nor could this Muslim come across that type of evidence. So, um, yeah, watch the video. Uh, watch all the stuff that Mel does at, at Sneakers Corner. Um, and I think he does a lot of work with um, Jay Smith as well at, at Fander Film. So go ahead and check out those channels if you want to get down with the skinny on what's going on with the uh, the standard Islamic narrative. Absolutely. So getting back to our subject mm -hmm. here, we're at uh, 622, right? Yep. So uh, I'm going to juxtapose, right, that, that Jesus is telling us to focus on God. And the next slide is to focus on Jesus, right? And I'm going to explain why Jesus is God according to himself in this particular passage. Your eye, Jesus says, is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. Now, um, who is Jesus? Well, Jesus says that I am the light of the world. So we want to focus on God is what he's telling us. He says our eyes need to be healthy so that we can see the light for our body. And if we have light entering into our eyes, if we're focusing, if we're seeing the light, then we are guided to heaven, right? So Jesus is the light of the world. So now we know that Jesus is telling us to keep his eyes fixed on God, who is the light. We know that Jesus is the light. This is clearly Jesus claiming to be the light of the world, to be God, right? Um, here's, here's what I'm going to talk about on a side note here as well. Um, let's see. All right. Uh, let me do this real quick. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? Okay. So here's, here's a side note. This is a story that you may or may not have heard, Thaddeus. It's from um, The Sealed Nectar. It's a biography on Muhammad. Have you heard of that book before? Yeah, I would say it's the most popular Sira mm -hmm. biography of Muhammad yep. today anyway. Yep. And speaking of the Muslim I was talking to, that's what he, he want. He's like, you need to read this book before I talk to you ever again. <laughs> I was like, all right, fine, buddy. I'm going to read this book and then I'm going to show you this passage. <laughs> um, so speaking of eyes, right? Speaking of eyes and being healthy with your eyes, the biography about Muhammad records a time when some murders and robbers were caught by Muhammad. And guess what Muhammad did to them? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? He just murdered them back. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, uh, he would have to rob them back, right? He would have to take their stuff. <laughs> he did. He did a lot of stuff, right? So, uh, again, again uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. If, if that's what your principle of morality is, okay. I'll let that stand on its own. That's different than the principle of morality that Jesus taught, but we're going to go with it, okay? So this is what he did to those robbers. He had their hands and feet cut off, right? That was the first thing that he did. All right, they stole. That's one of the rules of Islam. You got to chop off their hands and feet from opposite sides. Okay, seems barbaric, but that's within the confines of Islamic teachings, Islamic justice. Here's where, here's where it gets interesting. They had their eyes gouged out with hot iron. 
speaking of eyes, right? Can you imagine that? You robbed and murdered someone, right? You deserve capital punishment. I have no problem with capital punishment, right? But to torture them, to gouge their eyes out with iron, and then he executed them via crucifixion. And then, you know, how is this justified? How is this justified, Thaddeus? Well, Quran chapter 5, verse 33 says, The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive with might and main for mischief through the land, execution or crucifixion or cutting off the hands and feet from opposite sides or exile from the land, that is their disgrace in this world and a heavy punishment is theirs thereafter. Right? So this is just a story of not justice, not mercy, not forgiveness, not anything. And, and what Muhammad did was actually beyond what even the, the Quran says to do. Your and of course, we got that that convenient little phrase there, mischief in the land, which can be defined as whatever the ruler wants it to be, basically. Well, it is. And then the other question that somebody needs to ask themselves is, OK, I understand how I can wage war against Muhammad, even though he is dead, but I could wage war against Muslims like today. Right. But how does someone go about r waging war against Allah? Isn't Allah transcendent beyond you know, time and space, unable to enter into creation, unable to be seen by anyone, even though his shin and hand and face and one of his two eyes can be seen. Um, how do you wage war against Allah? How do you do that? Now, that's a good question. I'm, I'm sure the Muslim would tell us that it's against his teachings or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But this is the perfectly clear Quran that explains itself in detail, and it doesn't say that. Right. And traditionally, Muslims have looked at, at uh, you know, explanations like that and said, you can't do that. You're going beyond what the Quran actually says. If it says wage war on Allah, it means wage war on Allah. Mm -hmm. So if we understand this to mean what I think it means is I can only wage war against Allah ideologically, right? That's how I can wage war against Allah. I can say Allah is Satan, right? Allah is the best of deceivers, which I'm not sure if that's waging war against him or just quoting him. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but what I'm trying to say is that's mischief in the land. That would be considered by Muslims, if they're really understanding this passage, to be mischief in the land. So by what you do, Thaddeus, what I do, what a lot of other YouTube apologists, especially polemicists against Islam are doing, is we are waging intellectual war against Allah. And according to this passage that we just read, Surah 533, it says that we are to have our hands and feet cut off, uh, we are to be crucified, and we are to be killed. So that's, that's why you true. can justify, that is why you can justify people who have drawn pictures of Muhammad. That's why Muslims can sit there and, you know, the Charlie Hebdo situation. Um, the school teacher who showed the Charlie Hebdo pictures in class, he had his head nearly chopped off by a Muslim. And obviously Muslims were offended by the Charlie Hebdo pictures because that's war against Allah and his messenger, right? That's ideological warfare. And according to them, that's spreading mischief in the land. And the best thing that they can do is kill that person for it. They're actually, and this is what's interesting, they're doing a law a favor, apparently. <laughs> they're... <laughs> Allah can't do it himself, so he has decided to entrust his killing of people who wage war against him to mere human beings. It's uh, so Carl uh, did, or, or sorry, Carol did ask, why do they say uh, cut off hands and feet from the opposite sides? Aren't hands and feet always on opposite sides? And I think the idea is one hand and one foot on yep. opposite sides. Yeah. So um, it, it, the idea again, like I, I, I don't think that this is an appropriate punishment for anyone. But the idea within Islam is that if, if you catch someone who is stealing, well, it was their hand that did it, right? So you cut off the hand that did it. Um, maybe the foot's the getaway stick. I'm not really sure why they cut off the foot, but, uh, you know, that's what they do. So it. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm not really sure how that's any more merciful than cutting off two right hands or, or Sorry, a right hand. Sorry, I, the, the note confused. said except all is two right hands. But yeah. I meant to actually say a, a right hand and a right foot. 
Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know which is worse, one right hand and a left foot, or one right hand and one right foot. I mean, they kind of seem the same thing. <laughs> well, if if you're if you're using proper throwing techniques, Thaddeus, you want to throw, you want to step with your opposite foot and throw with the opposite hand. So it's still allowing the person to throw rocks. Gotcha. Although in in all the videos of Muslims riding, they tend to throw with the same hand and foot. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> <laughs> not specifically, no. <laughs> they, uh, they do not throw appropriately. And, uh, you actually might hilarious. be on to something there, though, because it al- still allows them to, to participate in warfare of the 7th century, mm-hmm. thus allowing them to earn enough good karma to, to get out of their, <laughs> their bad karma for stealing. Oh, those crazy Hindus, man. What's <laughs> up with that? Um, all right. So who is our master? Jesus is our master, right? God is our master. That is who we need to serve. And this is what Jesus says about um, uh, worldly wealth and gain relative to heavenly wealth and gain. He says, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Thaddeus. I thought about this actually last week for maybe the first time. What did Muhammad do for a living when he was a prophet? Uh, nothing directly. I, right. I mean, as far as doing, he didn't do anything. He yeah, just like relied he... on taking his share of the war booty mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, also on donations. Yeah, interesting. What did Jesus do during his ministry? Did he have a job? Uh during his ministry, I, I'm not really sure mm-hmm. if he would still be working as a carpenter. I think yeah. he did also rely on donations. Mm-hmm. Right. And how about Paul? Did he have a job? Paul did. He he made a point of saying that while he was entitled to uh, donations as a minister of the church, he'd mm-hmm. rather work with his own hands to earn a living because that's more satisfying. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? So you you kind of alluded to, to what Muhammad's actual job was, right? So I Google search an image. It's not real clear here, but it says, he who makes money pleases God, quote, Muhammad, right? <laughs> so are we focused on, on, you know, loving God or are we focused on ourselves and making sure that we've got enough money and can somehow, some way, our earnings of money pleases God? Well, like you said earlier, Thaddeus, if I were just to invent a religion and I wanted power and wealth and money, that might be something that I would say, right? Make more money. If you make more money, guess what you can pay more of? Taxes, zakat, jizya, right? Whatever it is. Um, It seems to me, like you said, and like uh, Lloyd always says, it's a political system first, right? This is a political system designed to dominate the entire world, to subjugate anyone who is not part of your clan. Um, And, and, those are that's basically Muslims or Muslims being told to focus on the wealth of this world and reject the wealth, right? Like Jesus said, uh, of the kingdom of heaven, right? You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money unless you listen to what Muhammad said. So, because he didn't have a job, he took the zakat, he took jizya, right? And jizya is um, when you subjugate, uh, subjugate a Christian or a Jew or Sabian, which I don't even know, do they ever exist? Um, basically, <laughs> you you force them to be humiliated. You make them a second-class citizen, and then you force them to pay you a tax, is what Muslims like to call this. Um, but I'm curious as to how paying the jizya is different than paying the mafia not to murder you, right? Because the rules of Islam say that well, if you're a Jew or a Christian, you get conquered by Muslim lands. Well, you've got, um, you really have got three options. Option one, convert to Islam. Then you just pay the zakat instead of the jizya, right? That's what they want. They still get money. Or two, uh, you can still worship Jesus and uh, be a Jewish person, um, but you have to pay us money. Or three, if you refuse to pay us money and you refuse to become a Muslim, we kill you. We fight you, right? So what are you paying money for, Thaddeus? Yeah, well, you know, the Muslim's going to tell us that it's to provide for roads and 
<laughs> all the things the state provides. But if we actually take the text seriously, mm -hmm. it, two purposes. One is for protection, mm -hmm. the, you know, mob protection money, basically. Yeah. And two is to acknowledge your inferiority, that right. you are forced to pay this against your mm -hmm. will. Yep. Uh, and that's the, the main purpose. The, the income is, is nice for the, you know, the Muslim rulers. But the main purpose is to make you feel like you're inferior and give you an incentive to convert to Islam. Yeah. And, and Jesus says, first and foremost, if you're persecuted and oppressed, God blesses you. So thank you, Muslims, for blessing many, many Christians, although giving them hardships, they were earning rewards in heaven. Um, but you, you mentioned protection. They provide you protection. Who, who are the Muslims protecting you from? Uh, from themselves, then. You know, like I said, mob protection money. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> hey, we're going to be awesome to you. We're going to let you pay us money so we don't murder you. Exactly. Seems seems fair enough, right? So that was a part of Muhammad's mission, right, was to convince people that he was a prophet. But once he gained power, the rest of his mission, like I said, uh, was to subjugate everyone by either killing them, enslaving them, copulating with them, even if they're still married to their husbands, taking all of their money, forcing them to pay a tax to him, right? So Muhammad taught his followers to value wealth above valuing God. So I'm going to I'm going to try a little contrast out here. And we mentioned this a little bit in the last stream, but I want to I want to lay it out again. Jesus was led into the desert by the Holy Spirit after his baptism, right? That is. That is correct. Okay. And this is where Satan approaches him. And one of the things that Satan offered him was wealth. Correct. Right? Worldly wealth. He, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and he said, you can have all of this if you just bow down and worship me. Right? Now, did, did Jesus go, oh, that sounds great. Let me do that. Is that what Jesus said? No, that's not what he said. No. Oh. He, what did he end up saying? Uh, well, it, and, and not those exact words, but no, thank you. <laughs> yep. He said, be gone from me, Satan, right? He resisted the devil and the devil fled. Okay. And then instead of gaining all of the world's wealth and power and um, all those types of things that any human, right? Regular human might be tempted to, to desire. What did Jesus get instead? He got a uh, humiliating death on the cross. He did. And why did he do that again? Because he loves us. Oh, he loves us and he wants to have a relationship with, with us. And so he, he forsook worldly wealth and pleasures and Satan worship so that he could die on a cross to uh, forgive our sins. Yes, to, that, to take the curse that's rightfully ours upon mm, himself yeah. to repair the relationship between us and God. Right, so the wages of sin is death, but thanks to be to Christ who gave his blood for us and we are forgiven. Um, a similar thing happened to Muhammad, believe it or not. He, uh, he was in a cave, apparently, before his ministry, and uh, he was nearly choked to death three times by what he calls later, actually not even him, he, Muslims have decided that this was the archangel Gabriel, or what they call him, Jibril. And although the, the, the record doesn't say that Jibril offered him, you know, wealth and power and all those kinds of things, um, he, he, let's pause, let's, let's, let's put a pause on that. So he is approached by this demon, that's what I'm with Satan himself, just like Jesus was approached. And Muhammad before that, by all accounts, was a stand-up gentleman, right, Thaddeus? He seemed mm -hmm. to, he yes. was married, he was married to Khadija, he was very loyal to her, he was very honest, he was known as a very honest and hardworking person, helping her uh, with her affairs and all those types of things. People really trusted Muhammad. He actually sounds to me like a pretty good dude, okay? After his encounter with this spirit being, whom I will call Satan, did did he go out and try to get all the same things that Jesus rejected from Satan? Worldly power, wealth, um, all those things? Uh, he did. Hmm. Strangely enough, he, his uh, revelations ended up serving his purposes in the earthly 
sphere. Yeah. Um, so Muslims, in case you were wondering why Christians think Allah is Satan or Jibril <laughs> is Satan, it's because of this. It's, there's multiple reasons, of course. Um, but Muhammad went from being what seemed to be an upstanding person, right, to being this warmongering, child-marrying, uh, polygamist, terrorist who was bewitched, apparently, which is neither here nor there, and, and a pedophile. He had multiple wives. He murdered multiple people. He had people tortured and killed for their money. His entire aim was to subjugate first and foremost the Arabian Peninsula and then the entire world, right? Meanwhile, getting all of uh, one fifth of all the war booty and all of these types of things. And if he so much as looked at a married woman of a Muslim and he wanted her, the Muslim was supposed to just give it to him. That sounds to me like someone who was a good person, allowed Satan to uh, enter into their life, and then became satanic, right? And then since then, he has convinced billions of poor Muslim souls to worship Satan, a character that fits the bill of Satan. And in, um, is it Ezekiel? Ezekiel talks about how Satan wants to rise above the throne of Allah. Lucifer wants to rise above the throne of Allah and um, and be worshipped like God. Isn't it interesting that this uh, desert um, demon has convinced so many people that he is like God, although when we really read about him, it's pretty clear that he is 100% evil. Before you go on, I have a, a couple comments uh, and a question from the audience as well. We have to ask this question. Well, first of all, we're, we're kind of at this point, we're assuming that the Islamic narrative is true, which, which may not be actually the case. But, mm -hmm. you know, let's take that for granted. So this is according to Muslims. This is according to Muslims that Muhammad was transformed into a ordinary upstanding citizen mm -hmm. into this power hungry, uh, pleasure seeking dude. Yeah. And we have to ask the question, what was he doing in that cave in the first place? Mm. And I, I think that, you know, if we're taking the, the narrative seriously, it appears that he was practicing Jewish mysticism, that he was trying to f get close to God, uh, that he was, you know, performing certain rituals in order to try to get to God because he lacked a relationship. He, he wasn't a Christian. He lacked a true relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And his own impression is that he's probably been possessed by a demon, yeah. which is a side effect uh, of Jewish mysticism. And if you go wrong, you, you know, if you go right, you can get up into God's throne room and, and experience his presence. But mm -hmm. Most of the time, things are going to go wrong because you're, you're, you know, you're practicing this very dangerous thing where you're trying to tap into the spiritual world, which makes you very vulnerable to demons. So Muhammad yep. comes and says, I think I, I might be possessed by a demon. Mm -hmm. And Khadija says, uh, take your pick. Either she says, uh, you know, this is my husband. I, I care about him. I, I want the best for him. Or she says, cha-ching. <laughs> what? what, what, what this is our opportunity to cash in big here if we can mm -hmm. convince everyone that he's getting revelations. Yep. And unfortunately, whatever her motives might have been, she ends up creating the, this religion that oppresses women because mm -hmm. she was looking out for, uh, you know, her own self-interest at that yeah. time. And ultimately, because Muhammad didn't have a relationship with God and was trying to create one on his own efforts. Yeah. No, it's it's very true, right? It it always reminds me of the Tower of Babel, right? That they're they're trying to build this tower into heaven, and and God, you know, says no, you can't do it on your own. You need me to be able to get you into into heaven, which is obviously uh, what Christ did, and that's obviously what happened on the day of Pentecost, right? Because when God scattered them at the Tower of Babel, um, they their language was one, and then it became many. But then on the uh, night of Pentecost or the day of Pentecost, uh, the Holy Spirit came down and made all these different languages come across as one language to preach one gospel. Um, we could so, go, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so Scruffles says, what witness did Muhammad have that he spoke to or seen anyone who was a witness was everything purely from Muhammad only. So there are a couple mm -hmm. Hadith 
later that say that someone witnessed so-and-so leaving Muhammad's house. And he's like, no, 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 that wasn't so-and-so. That was the angel Gabriel. Right. Um, but as far as his original uh, revelations, the, what set him on the path to being a prophet, of course, he's the only witness. And his own testimony about that yep. is that it yep. seemed demonic to him. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. And and what's crazy about that particular story, right, is is the criteria of embarrassment. No Muslim wants to, no Muslim's going to write that uh, if they're making it up to make Muhammad look good, right? A Muslim's going to write that story. It, it's embarrassing for Muhammad, right, to be afraid, to be running away like a little baby. And, um, you know, to think that he was possessed by a demon, that's embarrassing. So, to me, in my opinion, based on the criteria of embarrassment, that's actually a true story. This guy, Muhammad, right, really did encounter some sort of spirit being or thought he encountered some sort of spirit being. There's lots of theories about, you know, seizures and all kinds of stuff. But he believed that he encountered a spirit being. And then he believed that somehow that anointing uh, or that somehow that anointed him as some sort of prophet of of God. Um, and uh, two two little brief stories here. One apparently <laughs> Muhammad, you know, like how they, like the cartoons depict like you have an angel on one shoulder and a demon on the other. That concept is in Sunni Islam, that there's like an angel on one side and a demon on the other side or a jinn. Um, and <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Muhammad uh, claims that his devil on the, uh, whatever shoulder it was on, he converted that devil to Islam. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> he then he then goes on to say that uh, the, his demon only commands him for good. So that means that Muhammad was actually just listening to this jinn demon, assuming that the jinn demon was telling him to do the right things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, did he actually have to convert him, though? Or was this jinn already a, a, a uh, Muslim? <laughs> whatever, whatever Muhammad believed is, is what Muhammad believed. And that's still that's still in the Hadith literature that you can go ahead and, and read about today. And then, of course, the infamous or the famous satanic verses where, um, you know, we all know that Allah put down a thing. Well, this Quran can only be for me because no one can make a surah or a chapter or many surahs like it, depending upon which which verse you're reading it. The, the criteria changes a little bit. Um, even though there's a surah of the jinn and the jinn is speaking the whole time, which the jinn apparently created a surah like Allah's surah. That's neither here nor there. Or uh, number two is, you know, Muhammad received revelation from, he admits this, the shaitan from Satan. And he pronounces a false statement. And nobody, nobody, including Muhammad, knew that the revelation he was spouting was not really a laws. It was actually the devil's revelation. Um, so the, the Satan himself, all glory be to him, according to Muslims, um, tricked Muhammad. He met the criteria of no one can make a, uh, a surah like it. Satan did. Satan did it. And the jinn also did it. Um, so sorry, Muslims, your own, criteria, your own Quran's criteria actually makes Islam and the Quran false. Think about that one for a second. Absolutely. Uh, so John 6, 29 asked, did he take the Shahada? Did that little demon on the shoulder take the Shahada? <laughs> uh, I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. Uh, I don't know if the story says that he did or didn't. Um, but yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, and then we had this real question earlier that I wanted to get to. Mm -hmm. So uh, Christianity and Islam are parallel. I think you should write perpendicular but in any case uh, Jesus was led into the wilderness Muslims interpret this to mean having authority over Jesus because Muhammad was under the influence uh, of a demon in his bewitchment what is your take on this so if uh, Jesus was led into the desert by the Holy Spirit yeah. does that mean he's subject to uh, the Holy Spirit uh, no, that means that Jesus' earthly body and his human nature um, was not an atheist, and he relied upon God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, as well as his own spirit, to to guide him, right? And a lot of the Bible is written for the intention, right, not only to tell the actual story of what happened, but for us as readers to understand how the Trinity works, how God works, how all of these things correspond uh, together, so...
I don't know if that answers the question fully. There was a lot to that question. Um, yeah. And, and you know, it, it, Jesus is our, our perfect example, right? Mm -hmm. So he's going to listen to the witness of, of the Holy Spirit and, right. and follow. I mean, he could have resisted. It's not like he was incapable of right. resisting. His, his human nature was capable of, of any sin that any other human nature was, was capable of. But he Absolutely. chose to be perfect, which is pretty awesome for us. Because if he wasn't perfect, then our sins cannot possibly be forgiven. Absolutely. So you can continue with the presentation there. I think that was a very helpful uh, sidebar. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so trust God. We're continuing to focus on faith and trust in God and not in worldly possessions. So Jesus goes on to say, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Again, he wants us to focus on the kingdom of heaven and not on this particular world. He says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? How many people are we going to plunder so that we can take their money and food <laughs> and wives? Oh, I'm sorry. I, my bad. Uh, what will we wear? Right? Um, these things dominate the thoughts of, what's that say there, Thaddeus? The thoughts of who? Unbelievers. Unbelievers. Um, and let's talk about what to wear. Are there strict rules about how Muslims are supposed to dress? There are. And in fact, we in the West are usually unaware of a lot of them. But there mm -hmm. are numerous guidelines on how to dress for both men and women, not just women. Yeah. And Jesus says explicitly here, these dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already already knows all of your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. So do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. All right? So going back to the very first verse, the true reward, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. Instead, keep your eyes fixed on God and on the kingdom of heaven. So we're going to do a brief review, and then we can open things up. Uh, Thaddeus, if there's questions or people who want to call in. Here's a review of the past two lectures. We learned in lecture one that Allah is a pagan. He swears like a pagan and he doesn't forgive like a pagan and he loves like a pagan. We discussed how marriage is not sacred in Islam. It's a slave to master relationship, whereas it is sacred in Christianity because the Christ's love for us and is like a man's love um, for, uh, or sorry, a Christ's love for the church is like a man's love for his wife. And we ought to be willing to lay down ourselves for her. Allah, because of his pride and arrogance, will not inherit the earth. Allah preaches and teaches his adherents to do what Jesus calls hypocrisy. Allah focuses on worldly, earthly pleasures, also known as hedonism. So based on these two lectures we've talked about, Thaddeus, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Jesus for the win. <laughs> So I did post the link for anyone who wants to come up and join us uh, about 20 minutes ago. Swati, after coming out of time out, he complained that I put him in time out. I explained why he was put in time out for talking about off topic stuff. And then he kept posting over and over again, what is the name of God in Aramaic, which had absolutely nothing to do with what we we're talking about. So I mm -hmm. turned him out a second time 
And he seems to have since disappeared. Oh, hmm. We, we uh, will give a few minutes for any Muslim watching who wants to come up. And I do have some comments mm -hmm. to go over in the meantime. So this one was just posted by XT Matt. I don't know if he's a, a Muslim. He's an know. extraterrestrial. <laughs> um, he quotes this Quran verse. This is a right way with me. Surely as regards my servants, you have no authority over them except those who follow you of the deviators. Uh, and this, he added that his, um, this is Allah speaking to Satan. So I'm not quite sure if he's trying to, I mean, I guess he's trying to defend Islam, but I don't yeah. really see what the connection well, is. Well, so, so this is what Muslims are going to do. And I think this is a, a decent argument. The problem that, that arises with this is there's so many different contradictions between the nature of Satan throughout the Bible and the nature of Allah in the Quran, right? Um, so yes, a lot of the Islamic teachings are teaching you to resist Satan, right? To, to turn away from him and to only follow a law and things like that. Right. So I don't have any problem with that concept, right? To resist evil and to, and to follow good. But the problem of, of a law and what he considers to be good is biblically speaking, and especially according to the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus, a law is commanding evil things to be done, right? Allah even brags about who who Jesus says was is the father of, of lies. Jesus says, you know, the Satan, uh, the devil is the father of lies. You are of your father, right? The devil. Um, and then, um, you know, lying is, is permissible within Islam for depending upon what school of thought you follow for a couple of different reasons. Um, it, we talked about last week about swearing by Allah, and it says that you can... You, don't don't swear by a law unless you're telling the truth, right? Which kind of implies that, well, you could say anything you want as long as you don't swear by a law, then it's fine, you're okay. Um, but there's just so many demonic things uh, that a law does according to the Bible that um, Satan would do. So uh, either it's a contradictory thing, right? The character of a law is just different from the character of Jesus, and Jesus is clearly morally superior to a law and his favorite messenger, Muhammad. Um, or he's Satan himself. If he's Satan himself and the best of deceivers, or the best of mackers, the best of planners, the best of schemers, however you want to translate it, um, he might kind of make a straw man Satan and say, oh, go against this fake Satan, but worship me, right? Um, so that's a, that's a possibility. I wouldn't, pass, wouldn't put it past a demon to be smart enough to kind of create that kind of diversion can't make any proof of that matter but uh again like i said when you look at the character of allah it's pretty clear that uh, if he's not satan himself he's at least a demon absolutely and i'll just add that uh he says that this verse implies that satan does have authority over the deviators oh i see what he's saying yeah and muhammad uh said or at least allegedly said mm -hmm. that Islam would divide into 72 sects or 73 mm -hmm. sects, depending on how you read yep. that. And all but one of them would be deviators. So apparently yep. Satan does have authority over the vast majority mm -hmm. of Muslims. Including Muhammad, right, who delivered the satanic verses. Um, so, yeah, interesting. So, oh, hold on one second froze up there for half a second when I was trying to switch over. Uh, so this was, was uh, left earlier, but it what didn't seem to be directly related to anything, so I thought it would be best to address it. Yeah, no, end. that's fine. Uh, so Ron says, when I visited a mosque one, guy, one time, a guy explained that some of the people try to get to the front because it is better. Much of what they did was good but could be better by doing it up front. And, and that's just, you know, that sorry to be blunt but that's just like the most pagan idea you could come up with mm -hmm. that somehow being in the front row makes you be able to communicate with god better uh, right i mean where 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 is god if he's not outside of the universe or you know everywhere or, or mm -hmm. however you want to look at that is he like confined to a specific space near the front row or something right where he can hear you better well, it's like he's trying to be seen by people, right? Like that's the that's the what Jesus speaks about, right? They're trying to get up front to be seen by people. Jesus also says um, that if you want to be the greatest among 
you, right? You must make yourself least. And the God of the universe humbled himself, right, to the pains of death on a cross. But he also told Peter and the disciples as he was washing their feet, right? Like, I must, I, I, you need to do this for other people as well, right? And think about back in those days, it was, you know, a lot of horses walking around in the streets and whatnot. So to wash someone's feet was a, was basically a slave type of behavior for someone to be doing. Um, and so the, if Muslims are taught to try to get to the front, right, to take the highest seat, then God says, and Jesus says that they will be humbled and humiliated because they will be kicked down to last. But if you go to the back, um, then someone might bring you forward. Um, and metaphorically speaking, that's basically just saying that God will lift you up um, if you remain humble. Uh, so Ruth asked if she could ask a question in Spanish. Do you know Spanish by any chance? Nada mucho, senorita. <laughs> Uh, no problem. Go ahead and, and put the question in and we'll put it through a machine translator and try our best. Yeah. And I don't know if Mary's here. I know Mary. I think Mary speaks Spanish. Too many Marys. Yeah, I think she's here. Mary, you speak yep. Spanish, don't you? <laughs> so uh, there was some clarification on the username Christian Islam are parallel. The idea is they never intersect. They have nothing in common. No, oh, that's, a, that's actually a good so nickname. That's I a, like that. That's a very... Uh, Sophisticated username there. I think yes. I understand it. I, I, I thought it might be a, a different thing because, you know, like uh, take passages that mean the same thing or that say the same event mm -hmm. in, in different parts of the Bible and you, it's called parallel passages. So I thought maybe he was saying that Christianity or that Islam had been copied from Christianity, but he did explain. Well, it depends on what you think Christianity is. If you think it's later Gnostic uh, heretics, then the, he might be onto something. So if you like the uh, the Gnostic Apocalypse of Peter or something like that, you might get this idea that uh, Jesus was not crucified and that uh, it made it, Allah only made it appear that he was. Excellent. So uh, Mary did say that she knows uh, Spanish and can translate. So excellent. Go ahead and pose that question for us. So uh, Ron also said Muslims will make the Sermon on the Mount into a law. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need the cross. We need to obey the law. And Jesus taught that. Can you comment on this? Um, well, first I'll say that you're probably right that Muslims would interpret this as law because everything's law in Islam. Right. Well, but how do, you, how do you respond to the suggestion that if you have enough laws, you're good? Well, um, I, I think we addressed this fairly deeply um, in, the, in the previous lecture. And Ron, I think you were there, but this is a good question. We can, we can reiterate it. Um, First and foremost, God is our only savior, right? We cannot save ourselves. That's that's a Jewish principle. That's a Christian principle. That's the principle of of, of Yahweh, right? Going back to the very first sin. Um, the very first sin, right, was Adam and Eve disobeyed the commandments of God. And God promised them that in the day that they ate of it, that they would die. Okay. We see that they do not actually physically die. Now, you can make an argument that it's a spiritual death, which I will agree with you. However, God promised that in the day they eat of it, they will die. Now, they cover themselves with fig leaves, right? When they realized they were naked and they were shamed, they covered themselves with fig leaves. Um, but God did not accept their own coverings, their own works to cover their own nakedness and, and shame. He instead provided them with animal skins, right? With animals which are alive, have to be killed in order to provide skins, right? So this is, the very, this is how God dealt with the very first sin. God dealt with the sin himself. He provided the sacrifice, like uh, Abraham says, to his son Isaac when he's taking him up to the altar um, to, to almost be sacrificed, right? And they, they provide a, a ram um, instead, of, um, instead of Isaac himself, which are, both of these things are foreshadowings to the coming of Christ where God ultimately takes away sins, um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll pause on that one. Now, when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount, right, most Muslims, they want to make everything into a Sharia law. They want to justify. And this is what's funny. They don't want to they don't want to connect themselves to the Bible. And yet they kind of have to connect themselves to the Bible because when the Quran says that they have to. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, but they want to turn everything into Sharia. They want to say Jesus was Muslim. Uh, Moses was Muslim. Abraham was Muslim, blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, so when Jesus says that he came to not abolish the law, they're going to go, oh, Jesus says that the laws of Moses 
are going to be forever and ever and ever, right? They'll skip past a few verses. They'll go to heaven and earth will not pass away, um, you know, until everything is accomplished. And they'll skip the part where Jesus is saying that he accomplishes everything himself and that the law won't pass away until he fulfills it, right? When we know that Jesus fulfilled the laws of Moses and the prophets, therefore he ushered in, as he said during the Last Supper, um, that uh, this is the blood of the new covenant, right? And Jesus essentially gave us two covenant commandments, love God with all your heart mind and soul, right? Which we find in the Old Testament and love your neighbor as yourself, which actually includes your enemy. To me, my opinion, this is a Jesus taught a virtue ethics system, right? To say, you know, look, mankind, be smart enough. You're guided by the Holy Spirit. You can you can determine what is right and what is wrong. You don't need to have these rigid rules and laws because as Paul says, they won't save you anyway. Your good deeds without having faith are as dirty rags. Absolutely. And the comment from Christianity and Islam are parallel. Christianity makes perfect sense from the Garden of Eden to the cross of Calvary. And absolutely. Amen. When you look at the Islamic claims about, um, let's just call it biblical history, the, the history that's described in the Bible, Muslims probably won't use that term, but it doesn't really lead anywhere it doesn't really make any sense just mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff happened for no apparent reason but when you look at the biblical narrative and you read it in light of the cross it is all pointing there everything that happens from the time uh so the fall happens and then everything that happens to that is po after that is pointing to the cross the restoration mm -hmm. for the fall yeah no exactly um I'm going to share a link. I can't remember exactly the name of the YouTube channel, but it's uh, it's basically Jesus and all of Scripture. Um, I don't know if you've seen that or not before, Thaddeus. I haven't, but um, that's they do very they do really cool like poetry and imagery, um, and their goal is basically to show you in every single book of the Bible how it points how it points to Jesus, and they do a really good job. Uh, I'm a pretty manly man. I can't tell if you can tell by my man bun and my beard. <laughs> um, but, uh, it's really moving. Like I'm usually like over there crying and, you know, all kinds of stuff when I watch the video. So they're really good. They're they're and they're, and they're theologically well done as well. So it's not just some like emotional appeal. It's actually very good stuff. Um, I will find it, post it, um, in the comment section whenever we finish this up. Absolutely. That sounds great. So here's the Spanish comment, which I'm not going to try to read in Spanish. But the translation is, I was listening to Hatun Tosh and other Christians in Hyde Park, mm -hmm. and in the evenings, I ended up dreaming that I am a Muslim or something similar. Mm -hmm. Is that normal? Um, so you, you may have a difference of opinion, uh, Thaddeus, than I, so I'll just give my opinion here really briefly. Um, I believe that the vast majority of dreams, the vast, vast, vast majority of dreams are 100% psychological, right? It's just a psychology. You watch a, you watch a scary movie, you have a dream that you're murdered. Um, you know, you're nervous about a test that you're going to have tomorrow and you dream that like you overslept or you're naked in class or something like that. Um, I really believe that 99.999% of dreams are strictly not supernatural they are very natural psychological events every once in a while i do truly believe that there are supernatural types of dreams and i think you will know the difference between them now i will say this paul warned against the fact that um even if an angel comes and teaches a different gospel message from heaven that you should not believe them you should test the spirits to determine whether or not they are from god and if they proclaim the gospel that you already know and you can say, yeah, they're from God. Um, but if they're proclaiming something different, either it's just a weird psychological dream. And again, I'm not a doctor or anything like that. This is my opinion. It's a weird psychological dream uh, just because you saw and, and witnessed these types of things. Um, or if, and it's probably not, but if it's some sort of de demonic thing, all they're trying to do is to get you to reject the true gospel. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll just add that... Um, you know, ancient people who believed that dreams could be messages from God, mm -hmm. even if you have that that belief, um, which I, I'm certainly not saying that belief is invalid. But even under that belief, people who 
uh, in ancient times would say that almost all dreams were, were meaningless, that you had to have specific reason to believe something was from God. So, right. I mean, I, I'm assuming you didn't pray to God before you went to sleep. Please give me a dream that I'm a Muslim if you want me to convert to Islam. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we do hear about Muslims converting to Christianity because of dreams, but mm -hmm. they're always prompted by something specific, right? Yeah. The, the, the person doesn't just randomly have a dream about Jesus and, and then decide to convert. Rather, they have an encounter, normally they have an encounter with, with a Christian and, the, and they're cu already curious, they're already thinking that they, they might want to convert to Christianity, and then they pray for a sign and then God grants them the sign. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say if uh, the... Um, the dream probably doesn't mean anything. It was just probably prompted, uh, like A.T. said, by the thoughts you were having because, you know, you yeah. heard people talking about Islam and then you had a dream about Islam and that's all there is to it. Yeah. So so Ruth, she said, I stopped listening to Hatsune at night because I don't want to become a Muslim. Um, I, I will tell you two things, Ruth. Um, one non-biblical and one biblical. Okay. First one, non-biblical. Um you don't become anything that you don't choose to become right first and foremost you it, it's not just going to like magically force you to become a muslim so you don't have to become uh a muslim if you don't want to be okay second of all i want to tell you this greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world okay and if you have accepted christ as your lord and savior the holy spirit god the holy spirit is dwelling within you and is greater than anything on the outside world Absolutely. And Mary made a comment about, you know, being a nightmare. Of course, when we have a nightmare about, uh, you know, being being murdered or being chased by a criminal mm -hmm. or, or whatever, the, or falling or, you know, whatever nightmare that he, you have, you don't say that that means that that's going to happen. Right. Um, so you were, like we said, you were probably thinking about how horrible Islam was right before you went to bed. And then that prompted your having nightmares about converting to Islam. Right. And if she was listening to it while she was sleeping, um, she could have been hearing a, like a Muslima say, I became a Muslim. I had a dream or, you know, something like I have no idea. This is just pure speculation. But um, I guess bottom line is um, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock into it. Think about it. Examine it. Have conversations with with people who, who you love and trust about it. Um, and uh, I and pray pray to Jesus to guide you to the right path, and I am very sure that He will. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we we can. I think it's legitimate and valid to seek out signs from God, mm -hmm. but I don't think we should ever make our decisions solely based on our perception of a sign, because signs are very easy to misinterpret. You know, they're very easy to see what you want to see and not see the reality. I would say. You know, determine what's true first and then uh, ask for a confirming sign from God if you, you need it. Uh, she left this follow-up comment. Uh, I didn't see a translation from Mary, so I'm just going with the, the machine. Mary's trans just speaking to her in Spanish. So yeah, the other thing so, I'll tell you, the other thing I'll tell you, uh, Ruth, is whatever Mary said, do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, by all means. Um, but the, the follow-up comment roughly translated, and now listening to them, I thought that not only Muhammad was under the influence of Satan, Satan influences people's lives. I personally struggle with intrusive thoughts since I was 13 years old and have depression. Yeah. And uh, I, I would agree, you know, that there are people who, you know, are Christian who would say that demonic influence isn't a real thing, that you know, this is all just psychological conditions that ancient people invented these ideas. And keep in mind, I'm saying that these are Christians that would say this kind of thing. I would disagree. I would say that demons definitely have authority and control over aspects of this world. Yeah. Um, but as Ask Truth said, uh, when we have Christ, the Holy Spirit living in us, we are able to overcome those forces we are able to resist them. The, the mm -hmm. unsaved and carnal person is not actually capable of resisting the demonic influences to sin and, and right. do things that are, are horrific. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the saved person, while they certainly fail many times, is capable of resisting. 
Absolutely. And, and I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here, Thaddeus, if that's okay. I'm going to try not to, but absolutely, uh, I'll, I'll try to make it as brief as possible. So Ruth, um, first and foremost, um, I'm sorry that you are going through these hard times, uh, struggling with depression. It's no joke, right? This isn't a joking matter, intrusive thoughts. Um, these are, these are real life situations that lots and lots of people do actually deal with. Um, there's nothing wrong with you. There, you're, you're great. God loves you. All those things. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about a guy that I met on clubhouse. He's a Christian ex Muslim, but he struggles with drug abuse problems. And he was telling us a story about how he would pray to get over his drug abuse problems and, uh, it would work for a while, but then he would turn back to drugs. And then he would go hit rock bottom, pray, turn in over and over and over again. You understand? So he, he was struggling very deeply um, with an issue. Okay. Just like we can all be struggling deeply with anxiety or depression or intrusive thoughts. Um, the advice I gave him is the same advice that I'm going to give to you. Okay. Yes. Pray. Pray continuously all the time. Okay. But. That's not the only thing that you need to do. A lot of people think, oh, if I just have Jesus in my life, all of my problems will go away. That's silly. Okay. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, we also have responsibility over, over our health and well being. Okay. So I'm going to tell you this little parable. Um, it goes like this, right? I'm going to try to butcher it. I'm going to try to go quick, though. Uh, this guy uh, heard on the news that a flood was coming towards him. And he said, well, I don't have to worry about this flood because um, I've got God. He will save me. Okay. As the rain starts coming down, one of his neighbors calls and says, hey, we're getting ready to leave. Do you want to join us? And he says, no, I've got God. I don't need to join you in your car and leave. Right. As the rain goes higher, someone in a canoe drives by or paddles by, says the same thing. Hey, man, hop on the canoe. We'll, we'll take you to dry ground. And he says, no, don't worry about it. God's got me. Flood keeps coming up higher and he's on the roof of his house. Helicopter comes, says, hop on, dude, like you're going to drown. He says, no, it's fine. God's got me. Okay. As you might imagine how the story concludes, he's dead. He, you know, goes up to heaven and, uh, you know, he's like, hey, God, like I had faith, man. Why didn't you save me? And God looks at him and he says, I don't, I'm not going to be, he says, dude, I sent you the newscaster to tell you the flood was coming. I sent you your neighbor in the car. I sent your other neighbor in a boat and I sent you a helicopter, right? I sent you all kinds of ways to get out of it. So what I'm trying to say is yes, we need God, but God sends us people in many, many different ways. So if, if you are having, and you may already be doing this, but if you are having intrusive thoughts, issues, struggling with depression, there's nothing wrong with going to seek professional help. God sends people and anoints people to be able to be very good at their jobs, right? Whether it be psychologists, psychiatrists, whether it be medications or anything like that, um, you are allowed to help yourself and you are allowed to seek other people for help. So I just want to encourage you uh, to do that and encourage anyone else if they're struggling in those ways. Yes, we rely on God, but we also need to realize that God sends us people, right? He doesn't just miraculously do things. He gives us the opportunity to take partnership with him and be in a relationship with him so that we can be blessed ourselves and we can be blessing others by allowing them to help us. All right. That was fairly well. That, that was very well put. And I'll just add that, you know, what, what I, I'm guessing you're probably not against um, medicine. You're probably not against taking drugs when you, when you get sick. And mental health is the same thing. You know, God has blessed us with excellent physical uh, advances to where we no longer are all that subject to physical illness. Mm -hmm. And he likewise has blessed us with mental health things. And there's a stigma against mental health issues in much of the, the modern world, but there really shouldn't be because it, it's no different than physical illness. It's something beyond your control and it's something that uh, help is available for. Absolutely. And, and Jesus said, you know, when he was casting out demons and healing blind people and raising the dead, and he said, you will do many 
things like this and even greater things. Um, and I think a lot of us think that, oh, if we just put our hands on someone, we'll raise them from the dead. No, uh, I believe, and this is my own personal belief. Uh, if you don't believe it, that's fine. But I believe that modern medicine, um, the advancements in healthcare, all those types of things are actually doing incredible things. Um, so that's one of the ways that God works with people, even unbelievers, by the way, to bring about a greater quality of life. Absolutely. And with this comment from Christianity and Islam along the same lines, uh, we all have struggles, both Christ in uh, this life and strong determination. Every uh, one of our struggles pale to insignificance. And I'll just say amen to that. Amen. Uh, Ruth did say that, that she appreciated our responses, and I wanted to close out on this for a reason. So too many Marys earlier said, Safraz is too cowardly to try to defend the paraclete. He is going to run away forever rather than face his own declaration. And, you know, he, he ran for a couple reasons, but basically they were all the same reason. We were demanding evidence to back his positions and he couldn't supply any so instead of facing the problem instead of facing the fact that his opinions did not hold up to scrutiny he decided to run away and i just want to encourage any muslim who sees this stream or any other of my streams not run away you know if you can find real answers to real questions great uh, but if you can't then you need to face the consequences you need to realize that if Islam is actually true, you shouldn't have to run away. Your ideas should stand up to scrutiny. And we're going to get into my favorite passage next week, or whenever we're meeting, I can't remember, uh, where, where I get my name from, Matthew 7, 7. Ask, seek, knock. All right. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So thank you for joining us, everyone. Look for an announcement on when we'll be live for part three of this series. I think it's been a great series so far. Don't forget to like the video so that we can break the number of likes for the first one, like I asked at the start. And uh, stay tuned. I should have a new scripted video out this week looking at one of the so-called scientific miracle claims, specifically the separation of the seas. <gasps> I had a lot of fun making this video. It's in final edits. It's a, a bit different than, than my usual. I, I tried to make it fun and entertaining and uh, less serious, but while also still getting across the idea of how ridiculous these miracle claims actually are. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week. God bless. God bless you guys.